Well, good morning, Revive. Oh, that was great. As we've been in this series of Heart Check, as we've talked about messengers and what it looks like for those of us who call this our church home to be messengers of the good news of Jesus to the world, I am struck by something. I am struck by the reality that many people who call themselves followers of Christ do not take the challenge to be messengers seriously. That oftentimes we hear the call and we understand maybe that, that, that there's something more that we should be doing, but don't raise your hand, but I bet a lot of hands would go up. How many times have you heard the call of God on your life to do something and you came up with an excuse? I have to wash my hair today. I don't often say that, right? It doesn't take all that long. But when God calls us to do something, just, just answer in your heart. You know beyond the shadow of a doubt that he's called you to be a messenger, to take his good news somewhere, to act on his behalf somewhere in the world, but you come up with an excuse. Two weeks ago, we looked at Jonah. And Jonah had that almost that identical experience, although his wasn't just even an excuse. He flat out ran from God. How did that go for him? Well, he ended up in the belly of a fish. Jonah heard the voice of God. He knew what he was supposed to do. And he said, not Nineveh. Do you know who those people are? And he ran the other way. Eventually, God got his attention and focused his efforts and his energy. And when he did, he saw God's glory. Let that be to a lesson to us, messengers of the gospel. That when God calls us to do something, we may look at it just like Jonah. We may see the task in front of us and say, that, that's huge. I don't like that people group. I don't know what you're calling me to do. But when we step into God's plan for our lives, we see him move in incredible ways, right? Just like we just sang, have you witnessed it? Have you seen him a time and time again just do things that you thought were utterly impossible? Last week, we looked at Esther. Esther's story is really incredible because here you have this young woman who is brought into this beauty pageant, my favorite line from last week. I have to use it again. It's the bachelor Persian version. Remember, we said that last week. And that all these women were brought in to be the next queen, and it was like this year-long beauty pageant. And Esther rose to the top, not simply because she was beautiful, but because of her character and who she was. And as queen, she then had an opportunity when her people, when the Jewish people were in trouble and about to be killed, she had an opportunity to say one of two things. I'm either going to do something about it or I'm not. And when she said, and, and initially she said, I, I, I don't know what to do. If I go in front of the king, I might perish. But then after urging by her cousin Mordecai, she did go in and speak to the king she shared this line, which I think all of us should internalize this line, because as you do, as you come across difficult situations in your life, and if you remember this line alone, it will set you free. If you are able to say, if I perish, I perish. If the situation is difficult, so be it. It's difficult. If people make fun of me, well, so what? A lot of people make fun of me. If people think I'm weird, well, then maybe they re really know who I am, and I am weird. Esther said, if I perish, I perish. She went into the presence of the king, and as a result of her obedience, her people were free. And the genocide which was about to become them was ended and, and cut short before it happened. Today we look at a picture, we talk about Moses. Now, many of you know the story of Moses, but little of you know, very few of you know, we actually have a selfie of Moses at the burning bush. That's, he had an iPhone rock version, and he took a selfie in front of the burning bush. That's an actual photo. I found it online. And if it's on the internet, you know what? It's true. So there's Moses in front of the burning bush exactly, I don't know, somebody thought, exactly as it happened. But before Moses got to the burning bush, before he had this encounter with God where he was at a crossroads, he lived 80 years of his life. And 80 years of his life were actually fairly difficult. 
Moses was born, as many of you know, as it says in Exodus 1 and 2, Moses was born a Hebrew slave. The Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt, and Pharaoh was using them in this huge, and all these building projects to build and make bricks. And if you read the beginning of Exodus, you'll understand the entire story. But through their hard labor and effort, uh, they, they started to do something that nobody thought possible. They, they multiplied. And Pharaoh got really scared because all of a sudden there were so many Hebrew people that he thought if they got something and if they got angry, they could overtake all of Egypt. So Pharaoh came up with this wonderfully awful idea. When I think of this, it just brings pain to my heart. He said that every Hebrew um, newborn male will be killed as a way to control their population and to sort of hold back the tide of this growing number of people. So this started to happen, and the Egyptians went around killing all of these young Hebrew babies. And Moses' mother knew this was happening. She had her little precious, precious bundle of joy, and she said, you know what, I have a good idea. I'm going to send them down the river floating in a basket. It's exactly what happened in Scripture. So she took a basket, she coated it so that it wouldn't be filled with water and sink, and she sent her precious little baby floating down the Nile River. As Moses was in the river, Pharaoh's daughter was out, it says, in the river, and she saw this baby and she said, ah, look at this, here's a baby floating in the river, and she took him home as her own. The name Moses actually means, I drew him out of the water. So Moses born a Hebrew slave, was now going to be raised as a prince of Egypt with influence, education, wealth, all of that goes along with being a prince in the middle of Egypt. He wasn't your average kid, was he? Born a slave and then raised as a prince. It sounds like an an opportunity for a real identity crisis. Who am I? Moses had to often think, am I this Hebrew slave or am I truly a prince of Egypt? Where do I fall in this continuum that is my life? And then about 40 years old, Moses was strolling around one day and he saw an Egyptian slave master um, harassing and beating a, a Jewish, a Hebrew slave. So Moses did what anybody would do. He killed them. Not really anybody, but that's what Moses chose to do. Some of us have midlife crises where we go out and buy fancy cars or go on huge vacations or whatever the case may be. But at 40, Moses had this crisis and he didn't know what to do. And he had both of his worlds colliding and he, he killed that Egyptian. He murdered him and then buried his body in the sand. He thought nobody knew about it. He thought he got away with the crime until the next day in relatively the same area, two Hebrews started to say, aren't you, you killed that guy yesterday. Are you going to do the same in our dispute now? Word got to Pharaoh that Moses killed an Egyptian and Pharaoh then tried to kill Moses. Moses truly didn't belong anywhere. He was sort of an orphan in this world. He wasn't really a Hebrew. He was an Egyptian for a while, and then Pharaoh tried to kill him, so he fled to Midian, which is another incredible story that we'll dive into. But not only was Moses a Hebrew slave and then a prince of Egypt, but he was also a murderer. He moved to uh, Midian, and he became a shepherd. He he married... um, He married um, Jethro's daughter, and he, he became a shepherd. So now Moses, a Hebrew slave to an Egyptian prince to a murderer to now a shepherd tending flocks. What a roller coaster of his early 80 years of life. Those of you who are nearing 80, come on, you need to step up. Look what Moses was doing. Just teasing. For the next 40 years, life seemed to settled down for Moses. He tended sheep in the desert, and he was doing quite fine. And then one day, everything flipped upside down. Everything changed for Moses as he was tending to his flocks and doing what shepherds do. He had this encounter with God that changed his life, that changed his direction, against his will, perhaps, but God changed his direction. We'll pick the story up in Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. 
And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. If I saw a bush on fire continually without it burning up, it would catch my attention too. Then the Lord saw that he had gone over to look. God called him from within the bush. Moses! Moses! And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Moses was having an average day where he was out tending to sheep, doing the things shepherds do. He saw this bush on fire that would forever change the direction, the course, the focus of his life. As he approaches the bush, he sees it's not burning up. He hears a voice speaking to him. And then as he hears and recognizes it's God, he does something really quite remarkable. He shields and covers his face and turns away from it. Why did he do that? Was he afraid to look at God? Was God so scary? And what, what, what was going on? It doesn't say that, but it says the bush was on fire. Yet Moses hid his face. I think I know what was terrifying about that experience. It's not that God was in, that God, uh, Moses saw God. It was that God saw Moses. Moses knew in his heart the things he had done. He knew he had killed that Egyptian and that he'd been running for the last number of years. He knew that he'd, he'd been in the desert away from his people. He had guilt and shame over all that he, done, that he had done. So when he was in the presence of God, he hid his face for fear that God would really see who he was if he got close enough to him. Moses was afraid of his past, the things he'd done, the things he'd said, the way he'd killed somebody. So when he was face to face with God, he shrieked and covered his eyes and turned away because he thought God would truly see who he was. Many of us have the same trouble. Many of us, many people, when they're confronted with the reality of God or Jesus or the, the scriptures, they read the scriptures and they say, you know what, that's, that's great. I'm going to set that over here and I'm going to step away. Why do they do that? For many people, it's because they fear what God might say when he looks deep into their hearts. When he sees who they are, where they've been, what they've done, what they've thought, the things that they've done in their lives, when people hear and understand that God is all-knowing, all-seeing, and that he knows the matters of our hearts, some people shut themselves off for fear of their past and what they have done, thinking God will punish them and he doesn't see them and he's angry with the steps they have taken. Just like Moses, many shelter themselves from God because they don't want to be seen by him, because they understand the reality of their lives. What they don't understand is that whatever that past has been, whatever things have been done, whatever thoughts have, been, have occurred, God still loves them. God still loves you, no matter where you've been or what you've done. Let's see how this conversation with God and Moses works out. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious place, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. But why did it take 400 years, God, for you to see this? 
I'm glad you spoke to Moses through this burning bush. I'm glad you've had this encounter. But why 400 years of suffering, generation of generation being slaves in Egypt? Why, God? Why did you allow this to happen? Couldn't you have come in two years? Maybe 10 or 15. Why 400? Some of you feel that with whatever struggle you're going through in your life too. You see this thing that's happening. You understand the position you're in. Maybe where we are as a country. Maybe where you are as an individual. I don't know what the story is for you. And you see it and you ask God the same question. God, why is it taking you so long to do something, to do anything? Don't you see I'm struggling and suffering and this is too much to bear? God waited 400 years to go talk to Moses to deliver the Israelites. And maybe your situation has dragged on way too long. No, and you wonder if God even notices, if he even sees you and understands your situation. Well, I'm here to tell you today, God sees you. He sees you. He hears your cry. He hears you. He knows you're you're, you're crying out. Not only does he hear you, he's concerned about your situation, where you are and what you're doing. And this is the best part. And he has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. He sees you, he hears you, he's concerned about you, and he has a plan for your life. So there's a couple of things that could have been going on in Moses' mind at this moment. He could have initially said, yes, God's finally here and acting. He could have said, what? Where have you been? It's been 400 years. You're a little slow on the uptake, aren't you? He could have said that. He could have looked around behind other bushes, other trees, other rocks in the area, making sure that God was actually talking to him. And he could have said, are you talking to me? I don't know if you've noticed, but I I haven't been with my people in 40 years. And before that, I just looked at them from a distance. They don't like me very much. We don't know what was going on in Moses' mind. The scripture doesn't tell us what that inner dialogue was, but we do know how God responds to Moses, what he tells him to do. So now go, Moses. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I, God? Who am I? This is beautiful because what God is asking, he's asking Moses, all right, Moses, I know who you are. I know what you've done, but this is what I need you to do. All right, take notes. I need you to march into Egypt. Go right up to Pharaoh and say, hey, Pharaoh, it's been a while. We haven't seen each other. Hope you're doing well. Time to set my people free. I know, that means a lot to you. They're your, you use them, you abuse them, but I need them to go. Let's go. Come on, people, let's go. That's essentially what God was asking Moses to do. To walk into the most powerful nation, the most powerful country of that time, go to, straight up to its leader and say, you need to set them free. I'm taking them. Let's go. Why do you think Moses said, who am I? You want me to do what? He was helping, continuing to have this identity crisis, knowing where he's been, what he's done, how he has run away and hidden for all these years, and now God is calling him back to the very place he ran away from, and not only calling him back to go straight up to Pharaoh and say, you know, it's time to let them go. I'm going to take my people, and we're going to go, and we're going to worship in the desert, and then, by the way, we're never coming back. I need them. Let's go. Moses heard that, and he said, God, who am I? 
Moses reveals that after 80 years of life, he's not even really sure who he is. He's not confident in who he is. He doesn't understand where, where God has been leading him because he was born a slave. He was raised a prince. He escaped as a murderer, worked as a shepherd, and now God wants to send him as his messenger. God answers Moses' question by revealing who he is, not who Moses is. And God said, I will be with you. It's a good thing you'll be with me. And this will be the sign that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will come and worship on this mountain where we are right now. You will bring them back here and we will worship. And when we do, you will know that I am God. Moses is like, oh, that, that's, that's a tough one. It was roughly 500 miles from Egypt to Horeb where they were. Maybe the song, I would walk 500 miles, is ringing in his ear as they have this conversation. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I say? What shall I tell them? Moses flips his original question. From who am I that I should go? That who are you to send me into this awful situation? Who are you? There's no doubt that Moses was overwhelmed. If God wasn't to give him the reasons why he chose Moses, then Moses at least wanted to know who he was. What's your name? What, what, how do I identify you? Because right now you're just a burning bush in front of me. Who are you? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I can imagine there was an awkward, dramatic pause. Moses was waiting for God to complete the phrase, I am what? Who are you, God? But he doesn't complete the phrase. He doesn't use any adjectives or descriptors. He just lets it stand This is your answer. You simply tell them, I am. Two words that are barely two syllables. If Moses was asked who you are, I bet Moses would say, I am a Hebrew, but also an Egyptian. I am a slave, but also royalty. I'm educated, but I'm also a shepherd. How would you fill in the blank? Let's say you go to wherever you get coffee tomorrow morning and they ask for your name when you're ordering and you simply said, I am. They'd look at you a little crazy. I am what? No, just put on the cup. Just write I am. I got it. We would want to say, I am. Maybe the name your parents gave you at birth. Maybe the roles you filled, the jobs you held, your passions or possessions. I'm a loving husband, a good dad, an honoring son. Maybe you guys would disagree with that. My family's right there. Maybe I would say I'm a follower of Jesus. Maybe you would fill in the blank with something positive. I am loyal, trustworthy, dependable, optimistic. Or maybe you would take a little bit of the darker side. I'm overwhelmed, hurting, jaded, stuck. I'm depressed we would have an answer to that question. We couldn't get away with a simple I am, but but God can. God created everything we see, the heavens and the earth. He created the land and the oceans. He created every living creature, whether under the sea or on the ground, in the birds of the air. He created them all. He created our solar system and all that we see and experience. And although we are created and everything we see is created, God is the uncreated one. He always was. He always will be. He has no beginning. He has no end. He just is God. Wrap your mind around that for a moment. And in the middle of that tension, when God says simply, I am, he is saying, I am. Am any adjective I use would diminish who I really am because as soon as I'm something, I'm not something else. I am simply, I am. 
Well, that's not very helpful for Moses. God chose this phrase to describe himself because to add anything else to it would limit who God is. When it comes to your identity, (laughs) it's a tough question. When it comes to your identity and who you are, who has the right to fill in the blank? I am what? I want to propose to you There's only one being who has the right to fill in that blank, and that is God and God alone. God knows exactly who you are. He knows your past and everything you've done, and for some of you as I say that, that's incredibly difficult to hear. But let me also say this, that does not define who you are. Nor does your present define you. Who you are in the world today does not define you. Your job doesn't define you. Your family, your culture does not define you. Your bank account does not define you. The size of your clothes does not define you. And the kids you have does not define you. God alone defines you and tells you who you are. And do you know who you are? You're a child of God created in his likeness, created in his image to do acts of good work and service in this world. That's who you are. You were created to be a messenger of the gospel, to take the words that Jesus spoke and to spread them to the world. That's who we all are. So we learn from Moses' story that it doesn't matter what happened in your past. Your past doesn't define you or disqualify you from acts of service in the world. Your past doesn't define you or disqualify you from being a messenger to tell people who Jesus is. Isn't that good news? Sometimes I, I, over the years in ministry, I've spoke to people and I've been talking to them about Jesus and they said, yeah, but if you know what I did in college, if you knew what I did in my 20s, if you knew what I did earlier in my life, God doesn't want anything to do with me. That is wrong thinking. When God looks at you, you embrace him. You're a new creation for the old things have gone and the new things have come. When you call on the name of Jesus, you're transformed into a new creation. Moses had this unique opportunity with God to hear and to have this conversation. Then as the rest of the story goes, Moses went on to be one of the heroes of the scriptures. He, he led the Israelites out of captivity into eventually, well, he didn't make it into the promised land. He was like standing here and the promised land was there and he wasn't able to take that last step. But he read that led them to the brink of the promised land. He fulfilled his mission. God called him to be a messenger and although he, although he, he, he protested, he even said in the scripture, I don't speak well, so God gave him somebody who did speak well, Aaron, to be by his side, to walk with him, to be the mouthpiece. And through their partnership and what God did, the people were set free. God has called you to be a messenger. And I don't know, maybe your story won't be as big and grand as Moses. Maybe you won't lead an entire nation to freedom. But God has called you to be a messenger tomorrow in some very specific way for you and who you're created to be and the relationships you have. He has called you to be a messenger somewhere, somehow. Don't be like Jonah and run the other way. Don't be like Esther initially where you put up excuses Be like Esther after her her heart shifted and you say, if I perish, I perish. Moses gave excuses. He wanted to know who he was and who God was. He was trying to figure this all out. But eventually he said yes. He marched into Egypt. You have to read the story for yourself in Exodus if you haven't. He set his people free. What if Moses had said no? and walked away and never interacted with God again. We wouldn't know his story. It wouldn't be um, scripture worthy. He would have just fallen off the pages of the Bible like a footnote that nobody would ever talk about ever again. But because he said yes to God, we still remember him. 
we still talk about him and learn from him all these thousands of years later. God wants to write a story with your life. You can impact somebody if you say yes and you decide to be a messenger for God. Be like Moses. Follow that still small voice. Don't run from what it's saying, but embrace it. God, we thank you for this morning, this chance to be here, to learn together, to grow together, even to look at Moses this morning and how you used Moses to change the future, to change the the, the whole direction of a nation of people. And when he first had this encounter with you, he was scared and timid. He didn't know what to do. But Lord, you led him through it. As we hear your voice, lead us through just like you did, Moses. Take our hand. Lead us to where we need need to go. Lord, as individuals and as a church, use us to change our world one person at a time as we accept the call to be messengers of yours to take the word, the words of Jesus to the world. Father, we thank you. I thank you for your goodness and your love for us. And Lord, what an adventure to be used by you in these incredible ways. Speak to each of our hearts. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.